It's four o'clock, right? Should we begin? Okay, so this is going to be slightly interesting for me. This is a slight experiment in terms of uh, presentations. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to dedicate it, first of all, to my dead friend who suggested that I use OpenOffice. Um, so uh, I was just finishing off the slides, and I emphasized finishing off rather than actually starting to write them about an hour ago. And I got up halfway through, and OpenOffice like, did the normal thing of crashing. And when it's open source software, you know that it's your fault in some way, right? That you... Like it, when when like a PC crashes, uh, like running Windows, it's Bill Gates's fault, right? When a Mac crashes, well, that's just the way that Steve Jobs created the world. Um, and when Linux crashes, you should have submitted a patch, possibly six months ago, right? So, so it is all my fault, and I agree to that. And as penance, there are a few things I'm not going to do in this talk. Uh, one is actually kill my friend live on stage, because that's unpleasant, even for DEF CON. Um, two, though good, I would have a little demo sticker on my, uh, my program bit then, if that was the case. Um, I totally owned his corpse. The uh, other thing I'm not going to do is describe how the EFF works. If you'd like to know that, um, I'm afraid that's a top uh, secret that only the NSA is allowed to know, or people coming to the Ask the FF talk. So I'm not going to do that. Um, what I am going to do is try to explain how, if you um, are anywhere in the world, um, can set up something akin to a digital rights organization in the comfort of your own parent's cellar. And I'm going to do this by um, citing examples of, of what I did in, in this kind of context. Can people hear me? Because I feel like I'm, I'm sort of making beautiful love to this microphone, but, but okay, great. All right, I may start dancing around and playing The Price is Right on the other one shortly. Okay, this is the first thing OpenOffice did. It managed to make my first slide look like it's redacted. So I'm very happy about that. But these are the old EFF logos. Um, if any of you have bought the new t-shirts, and I'm really pleased that DEF CON is the kind of place where we at the EFF appear to just beg for money every 15 seconds. Um, if you do go out and buy the new t-shirts, they actually have a new logo. And this is my new slide mechanism, which is I'm actually using Finder mainly um, for my slide presentations from now on. It's proprietary, but you know, it's a filing system, so it's proven. Uh, we, have, we have a sixth um, little icon there, which is the international one, which is, um, it, I live in that icon. If you double click on that, my head appears. Um, and uh, I'm the international coordinator for uh, the EFF. Bonjour. Um, what does that involve? Well, in order to explain anything about the EFF, I do have to run through our standard shrink wrap NDA EULA. Um, uh, as you can see, um, oh, you can't really see what with the font and everything, but um, by looking, glancing, or thinking about this PowerPoint slide, basically um, I own a copyright on thoughts inside your head, and, uh, and they're protected by um, a technical protection device covered by the AMCA. Okay, this is how the EFF really works. Um, for one thing, uh, we don't necessarily work the way that a lot of people think we do. Um, there's often a theory um, that uh, the EFF sort of does everything. It's like the paramilitary wing of, um, of I don't know, boring policy wonks. Um, and, uh, you know, you frequently see this on Slashdot where somebody will post saying, there's, there's, a, there's a poor guy here and I think the MPA has killed its kitten. And, um, and they'll say, send in the EFF. And we, we don't actually do that anymore. Um, we, um, we primarily these days deal in what's known as impact litigation within the United States, which is to say we very, do very narrowly defined um, legal actions uh, in order to change the law within the U.S. We have about um, 20 or so uh, uh, lawyers who are experts in various different areas, and I'm sure if you've ever been to Ask the EFF, um, you'll, you'll see uh, the caliber of the people that we have. Um, and what we try to do is exact change from, uh, from within the system rather than the paramilitary kind of coup kind of plan. We leave that to people in Washington. Um, so uh, what, we, um, what that, that tends to mean as a consequence is that, um, strangely enough, we've been drawn more and more into the international arena. Now, why is that? Well, there's a small feature of, um, of the global information system that's known as policy laundering, which is basically if Congress doesn't give you what you want, you go away for a bit and then you come back into Washington and say, yeah, but Dad said it was okay. Where Dad in this context is, for instance, um, WIPO, 
the World Intellectual Property Organization, or possibly the EU. And the biggest example of this is, is something that we all have close to our hearts, which is the DMCA. The DMCA was actually proposed as, um, as a bill in Congress in around about 1996. It was called the National Information Infrastructure Copyright Protection Act, and it was an attempt to uh, head the internet off at the pass by copyright holders. Um, it was pretty much laughed out of Congress. It fell at the first hurdle. So um, the uh, rights holders organizations um, sort of scurried around the back of Congress, went to WIPO, um, uh, got the US and many other countries to sign a treaty that basically held pretty much all of the content of that bill, and then came back to Congress and said, well, we have to implement this because of our uh, global obligations. So um, this, this is the policy laundering procedure. So what the EFF um, realized we had to do at that point was to, was to you know, make a little canoe and, and set off to Geneva, a landlocked country um, and, uh, and uh, start speaking there. Now, uh, again, I'll leap into Finder here to show you what that kind of thing looks like. Uh, places like Geneva and um, WIPO and the United N, the United, the United N, that's like a nice rap name for the United Nations, um, have um, are generally, you know, stuff shirts, right? So, so and, and, and we go in and we have a sort of geek sensibility. This was the... Um, this was the T-shirt that our first representative to um, to WIPO um, gave. Um, this is um, this is the T-shirt that uh, Corey Doctorow designed. And um, if you've if you've ever met Corey, the idea of um, him walking into a, a standards making uh, um, meeting, you know, wearing his goggles and his balloon and cloak, um, uh, is quite quite something to behold. Um, and he did very well. Uh, along with uh, the uh, international lawyer, at, at bringing to, to force in these areas um, basically anybody who has um, a, a stake in the area of digital rights whose name doesn't end in AA. This was really the first time that, that anybody who wasn't uh, uh, an established rights holder or lobbying group had, uh, had made their presence felt. I mean, we, we weren't the first in these groups, um, but we were certainly one of the... the um, the leading sort of uh, uh, edge of, uh, of new orga organizations. Um, so who do we work with in these areas? Oh, secret money stuff, cool. Um, do do very, very independent. Um, so this is our secret internet internal structure, so just so I can reveal that to you. Um, oh, it used to do, you see, on PowerPoint, I had this great Eye in the Pyramid logo that would sinisterly appear there. I guess it's not open source enough. Um, so this is, this is our secret triangle of love. Um, so uh, um, we have the legal section, which is the lawyers. Um, we have the illegal section, um, which is uh, people like me, who, um, uh, you know, I-A-N-A-L, but, um, uh, but, you know, know a lot of people who are L, so can sort of fake it. Um, and we sit and do a lot of the activism stuff. And we have tech research. And uh, if you come to our meeting later, um, we'll, you'll meet Peter Eckersley, who um, will talk a little about the sort of research we do to try and anticipate things that will come up in the future. Um, our allies in this area, and this is one of the reasons why the EFF doesn't have to do everything, um, ha has grown over the last 16 or 17 years. Um, when the EFF started, as I'm sure um, many of you um, will, will know from, from flicking through Bruce Sterling, um, Sam's data, um, uh, it was originally intended to partly to be a sort of hacker defense foundation, partly to fund lawyers and legal actions, partly to do whatever needed to be done at that point. And, and it spread itself relatively um, widely at that level. These days, there are various different groups that, um, that are around who have enough um, force and potential to take on some of the issues that I think all of us hold close to our heart. A free Software Foundation is fairly obvious. Um, Chilling Effects is, is in many ways a spinning off uh, organization that, that monitors and tracks uh, DMCA takedowns. Creative Commons, um, ex-board member of uh, EFF, uh, Larry Lessig. Um, uh, obviously helping work within the system. Public Knowledge, um, an, uh, an excellent organization that perhaps doesn't always get um, the publicity it deserves because it works behind the doors um, in Washington and does a lot of the, uh, the lobbying there. Um, and these are the groups that, that we work with in the United States. What happened when we, we started moving into the international area is that there were certainly groups that, that um, that, that we work with internationally. Scarce Computer Club, there's the international branch of Creative Commons, Access for All, and um, uh, the free software guys are, are liberally scattered wherever you can get to fresh meat. Um, and um, 
uh, and the electronic frontier dollar country, which are a lot of um, organizations that popped up at the same time as the EFF did. But, but, but really we need more because we're, we're, we're naturally a very US-centric organization. And um, that kind of works well for Americans, um, but um, um, it's less useful when you're trying to uh, head off at the past the same kind of policy laundering that went on in the United States and still goes on um, in other countries. There are also a number of real advantages to uh, basing your uh, organization in other countries. Tax havens, they're useful. And, you know, sea land, that would probably be a good place to start the paramilitary movement. But, but also, um, um, uh, and this is actually true, that um, as opposed to everything else I've said, um, <laughs> That uh, if you're working within um, relatively small countries that are um, uh, unused to the kind of powerful uh, mega lobbying that goes on in the United States, and you know, I'm not going to use the word doomed with the United States in the same sentence, but you know, if you're from another country, you can kind of smell it. Um, uh, other countries often have a, a much easier pathway to achieving change, um, particularly, for instance, the Eastern European countries, where um, uh, we, we've had a number of occasions where um, their eagerness to sort of short circuit and leapfrog um, the um, sort of cruft and uh, vested interests that exist in somewhere like America has led them to be very open to the idea of copyright reform, to um, uh, liberal policies towards um, uh, reverse engineering and, uh, and security analysis. And, and it's, it's relatively easy compared to the kind of um, uh, force that we have to try and achieve to to get uh, a, a, an ear of um, of someone in government, and in Russia, you know, you can do a lot if you can get their ear. You can like send it back to them and threaten to anyway. Um, so okay, so so um, I'm going to give an example here of um, the um, uh, a particular project that we were involved in. But before I do, and uh, my uh, my colleagues at the EFF assassinate me, this is the secret power that you can all take home to uh, whatever country um, um, uh, you have a faked passport for. Um, this is the EFF's real secret power. I kind of learned this in about a month of working there. Um, Again, in PowerPoint, this would be done with a really clever reveal, you know, possibly one of the ones that does a springy piano number and kind of drizzles in like snowflakes, but, I, um, but the punchline just kind of appears in open source. There's no, there's no hiding secrets here. It's, there's no security by obscurity. Um, so, so the three things here is that they do have a phone at the EFF. Thank you t for your donations. Cheers. Um, and, um, and there is someone, Richard, if you ever try and call us, who uh, turns up to answer that phone, Richard Iscara, the most powerful person at the EFF. And uh, he is, although he claims not to be, uh, paid to answer that phone. What does this mean? This means that whenever anybody in the continental United States who works in journalism has no freaking clue how the internet, computers, or his shift button works, um, they call us. And, um, and they'll say things like, well, so I've just had this press release from the security company, and they say that there are hackers out there who have, I don't know, devised a virus that can... Um, 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 make people's penises fall off or, or grow if they haven't got one. Can that be done with Ruby on Rails? And, <laughs> and, and we can sit there and say, well, you can speak to this guy. He's a Ruby on Rails expert um, and he'll tell you in a straight face whether that is true or not. And so we act as a sort of clearinghouse for idiots. No, we have a, act as a clearinghouse for the media. Sorry. Skip my notes slightly. Um, and this, this, this is actually an incredibly important role that organizations like the EFF have taken for a very long time. And it's basically the core um, use that any organization that you're going to start somewhere else it, um, it, it is there to take. And, and these are the three things you need. Now, the important one on that list, how am I doing for time? Good. Um, is, is the word paid, right? And, um, and this is problematic um, because. Uh, um, well, let's put it this way. There are a lot of advantages to not being paid um, in the world of um, hacking, um, open source development, and hacking in the sort of widest term, and sort of forming um, intentional communities online. If anybody's ever been involved in those sort of projects, you know that, that, that um, uh, uh, money is frequently kryptonite. 
into volunteer run projects, right? That as soon as money gets involved, then everybody starts getting very tense. Um, somebody spends it all on, on, on blow, um, or, 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 you know, begins to argue about how much people should be paid, or actually just sort of abstracting away the sort of social niceties of dealing with money. Um, the other problem is, is it just imposes incredible transactional costs, ironically, to running an organization. Because suddenly somebody has to look after the money, suddenly you have a really unfortunate relationship with the volunteers and the people you're working with. I mean, you can sort of imagine that supposing Linux had begun, but somebody was like paying Linux, like a fiver a bug fix. Um, right at the uh, right at the beginning, and everybody else would be kind of like, eh, I don't really want to get involved. And then you also lose um, the ability that organisations or, or sort of semi-official organisations have in the in the the hinterland that that, that most of us um, get involved in of being able to fairly seamlessly move from organization to organization or reform or change your roles. So, and you can see this from um, uh, open source projects, you can see this from uh, single event websites, um, you can see this in, in hacker groups, right? That, that there's, there's a bond of commitment about working on a particular project. Um, if money gets involved, that can be problematic. But also, more importantly, if money isn't involved, then you can kind of go, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty much bored of this. I think I'll move on to something like the, of something else. And it, it's not acrimonious, and um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not as problematic. The advantages, though, of money are A, the blow, um, and, um, and B, uh, a whole bunch of things basically around institutional continuity. Right? So, um, I mean, I've run um, activism campaigns and, and a lot of other people, you know, basically all you have to do is get a domain name and say, you know, a, a Perl script that allows you to sign a petition and you're pretty much a force to be reckoned with on the internet. You are the new move on, right? So, um, and, and none of that really requires much resources. Um, but what it does mean is once that event has finished, once that kind of we now have to stop them in the next 24 hours, there's, um, there's nothing holding that group together and, and very often they sort of dissipate and if you go back to those domains in, in, um, within a year, the people aren't involved, the mailing list is dead, there's no, there's no center to that. There's no, there's no reason for those people to remain committed. So what became apparent was that it's very useful to have at least one person in a country having some money. Having some money, sitting at a desk, answering a phone. Everybody else can, can carry on pretty much as they are already because one of the jobs of that person is to sit there and know who is doing what at that particular time. So that if, um, if somebody calls up and asks about Ruby, you can direct them to the Ruby. If somebody asks and says, okay, um, is, this, um, is this Bluetooth hacking story legitimate? You can pass them to, to you know, AL Digital or, 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 or whoever you, you, you have on your little list. Um, and the other thing you can do in that kind of context, if you have somebody sitting there answering the phone, is they're also the first stop point for reaction. Um, one of the biggest problems in almost any country um, is that uh, large lobbying interests or, um, or often politicians just went to wanting to scaremonger um, already have access to the media and even though the media has a sort of knee-jerk tendency to want to find the, off the opposite side, if it's not immediately in their contact list, they're just not going to do it, which is why um, um, and this is less true now, but it certainly used to be true. If you're um, if you're reading a newspaper and there's something about you know um, uh, people people downloading music or uh, um, throttling um, Elton John, um, then um, there'll there'll be no feedback, there'll be no response, there'll be no final paragraph that says. Um, a small man who appears to spend all his time in front of a monitor said that that's wrong. And there's nothing at all. Uh, there's just stuff that, that appears to be essentially propaganda for the other side. Now, if those people have a phone number and that they can call, um, or they just get a press release on their, um, on their uh, uh, computer within seconds of somebody standing up and saying that kind of thing, then they feel more comfortable about presenting these things in um, a separate size, um, story, a sort of more of a he said, she said kind of scenario. So um, I was uh, working at the EFF for about a month when um, we were kind of um, uh, wrapping up um, stuff that I was involved in, in the UK, and we decided to do this. Um, 
uh, it wasn't an EFF project so much as people who involved in stuff within the UK um, deciding to do something for themselves. And I came and said, look, I think this is probably what you want to do. And we hatched a plan. And this is the website, if you're, if you're going to hatch a similar plan, that you should, um, you should probably look into. This is, um, this is Pledge Bank, which is um, a, a little project um, done by man here, um, uh, Tom Steinberg, um, which was started in the UK but actually works internationally. If you can see at the top, this is the Canadian version and you can choose um, any country that you want. Um, they actually built a very interesting kind of geo data system that can, um, uh, uh, it's effectively a sort of open source gazetteer that lets you pick out um, um, different towns and it will know which, which country that town is in. And, um, and you start your own pledge. And basically the deal with this is, is that um, people will say, uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, they have some examples here, but the first one's in French, because this is Canada. Um, and I'm not that international. Uh, so you say, uh, I will um, decide to um, um, neuter my cat, but only if a hundred other people neuter their cats too. So it's a way of sort of building up some kind of rampant cat neutering organization. Or, in our case, um, digital rights. And this is the, um, this is the, the campaign that, that, um, that we did. I will create a standing order, which is the British for um, a regular check payment of five pounds per month, which is, I think, about five hundred dollars, um, to support an organisation that will campaign for digital rights in the UK, but only if a thousand people will do the same. So the plot here was this: that that we felt that if we could get together a budget of around about um, uh, one thousand times by five. You do the math. Um, um, per month, we would have a stable income in order to have that person sitting at a phone. And this is something that's, that's um, relatively easy to set up. Um, it doesn't trigger until there is enough support within your country. I mean, again, depending on the size and the existing community networks that you have, then, um, then th those numbers are going to be very different. Um, ironically, the funny story about this was is that because you don't really want to walk in to an existing community and say, hey, everybody, give me some money. Um, we sort of were quite sly about it. We had a sort of meeting that said, hey, I wonder why there isn't some sort of digital rights organization in the United Kingdom. I wonder why that is. Panel guest number one, why do you think that? Do you think it's under the table? wonder where it is. Until eventually the audience got so annoyed that they went, well, why don't we just do one? Why don't we just like pay some money and do it? Um, and, and we... Uh, then this is absolutely true, and I don't think I've ever told anyone this, that beforehand we went, okay, so what we'll do is somebody will say in the audience, let's do this. And then one of us say, well, how about a tenner a month? That's a really good idea. And then we'll put it up on Pledge Bank, and then we'll get the money, and we'll have everything do to do. And then somebody stood up perfectly on cue that we, somebody w wasn't involved in this evil global hacker conspiracy and said, I know, why don't we collect some money every month? And we went, yeah, that's a really good idea. And he went, how about five pounds a month? And we all went, no, that's like half the amount that we budgeted for. And everyone's going, yes, a thousand people, five pounds a month. That's a brilliant idea. And we're frantically sitting there going, I'm afraid somebody's not going not gonna to get their, their blow out of this. Um, so... <laughs> It was me. Um, so, uh, so that's what happened. And um, actually, surprisingly, you know, most people feel that they can budget that kind of thing when, um, when there's no previous access to the media, no previous presentation of uh, what they do in their life and what they think are important, apart from the occasional picture of a man in a silhouette with like le hexadecimal digits being projected onto his glasses, um, and, um, and no, uh, no uh, real involvement in the political process. Okay, so, so this was two years ago, and I want to just quickly go on and show you exactly um, what happens if you decide to do one of these things. Yeah, I got enough time. Um, the first thing you notice is that um, you're very scared. Um, particularly if there's only enough money to pay one particular person. You really ideally, and we were very lucky um, in having someone in Sue Charman who um, was very um, uh, accomplished and was just temporarily um, um, 
you know, had some spare time. She was doing freelance writing work, and she felt, yes, I, I, I can take this on board. But if you're, if you're a single person sort of, sort of sitting at a desk waiting for the phone to ring, um, that can be quite terrifying. And as I'll sort of go on to explain later, one of the things you really have to do is to make sure that there's a, a support network for whatever mug, I mean, powerful individual that you're going to actually take this money and, um, and sacrifice a big core of their life. But I mean, it, there is precedent for doing this. Um, Pledge Bank, um, which is the site that I pointed out there, the little, um, the little laughing man at the front of that is Tom Steinberg. And um, he did pretty much exactly this for Pledge Bank. He um, took three months off work and said, basically, I'm going to try and get funding for um, this, uh, this non-profit thing. And if I don't get it after three months, then um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back um, to doing what I was doing before. And he actually uh, worked for um, um, the cabinet office, which is fairly high up, sort of like a like a, um, a Washington sort of presidential kind of advisory board. But he, he felt that, that that it was important to do something like this, and um, and he managed to get the money. And um, and you can you can do this kind of thing by doing these these conditional. Well, we'll take a thousand people, and once we have that money, we'll go ahead and do it. And those people at least have the stability to know that they have that money um, um, going along. So you have this person, you set this person down, what do they do? Well, first of all, what they have to do is start sending out like rampaging press releases. The first year is completely reactionary, but fortunately you'll discover that there's plenty to be reactionary about, right? That if you actually do a Google search for hacker or digital rights or, or DRM or copyright um, onto Google News for your own country, you know, within about half an hour, you're spitting with rage and that's perfect. And like one of the things that I think, I think if you were to talk to Sue, she'd say is that she had to learn pretty quickly to just ramp down the you're all idiots kind of approach to sending out these press releases. Um, but pretty, pretty soon, people start contacting us. I mean, this isn't, this isn't um, entirely sort of representative, but, but this, is, this is all two years on, and you can, uh, you can, you can see that, that, that um, <coughs> well, there are 89 stories in that first headline that are, that are quoting the Open Rights Group. And remember, this is still basically just somebody in a desk Whenever the media wants to talk to a hacker or a security professional or somebody involved in, in this case, e-voting, which is just an area of concern that, 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 you know, there is no opposition and yet people are so determined to introduce e-voting into, into, um, into countries, even though that essentially, you know, there's just companies trying to sell them very badly designed hardware on the other side. Um, it was very quick and very easy to build up some kind of opposition to that. Um, so what, initially you're, you're somewhat reactionary and then an opportunity comes up where you can do something, where you have a bit of time and a bit of warning. And, um, and this, um, in the case of Org, was, um, was uh, uh, who knows who Cliff Richard here is here? <laughs> ah, that's showbiz, right? So Cliff Richard is kind of, how would you describe, he's like, that's useful. Thank you. Um, so Cliff Richard is like a sort of, if you took, yeah, right, like a superannuated John Denver. John Denver didn't have the smarts to fly into the sunset, to um, use the nicest possible description of that. Um, um, he's still around, Cliff Richard. And Cliff Richard was chosen. He was one of the earliest sort of uh, rock stars. Actually thinking about it, like basically everybody you could compare Cliff Richard to did die in some sort of horrible car, uh, plane accident, right? Because like, you know, he was kind of in the, the Dean kind of area. And Anyway, anyway. Buddy Holly, right? Buddy Holly, who, who had the misfortune to continue living. Anyway, he, he wants his pension now. And the way he wanted the pension is by extending copyright on all records. Now, he's already incredibly rich and sort of known for that, right? Um, and he's already... Uh, and, you know, he's not the greatest person to, to put on the TV going, please, please just extend copyright another 120 years. Um, because he's about 150 already. Um, and, um, but this was what the music industry were really sincere in doing. And the reason why was because of this policy laundering effect. And this is literally true what happened. The reason why copyright was extended in the United States was because everybody in the United States said, oh, Europe extended their copyright to 70 uh, plus life, so we have to extend ours. Um, so US extended copyright a certain amount, and then 
the music industry went to Europe and went, well, they've extended it, but they've extended a bit more than you extended it. So can you extend it? To, and and, and like basically, this was going to go on until, until you know, Larry Lessig exploded. So, um, so this, this became the campaign that the, 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 uh, the Open Rights Group picked upon initially. Um, and they got together some really, really good examples of people. They got the drummer from Blur, who looks younger than Cliff Richard and is smart. Um, they got um, um, various sort of um, economic analysis to, to show um, what effect this would have. And, um, and they presented the technical side of this. Um, and, um, and it got the response that this was the first time the government published a report. It was the first time ever that a government has turned down a request for copyright extension. Now, copyright extension is kind of on the fringes of what we might describe as the global hacker conspiracy, right? Um, but so things that are, that are more um, uh, central to these things, like electronic voting, um, like uh, digital rights management, um, one of the most interesting effects we had was um, getting um, a paper written to the BBC to explain to them why DRM was doomed, written by by Alan Cox, who um, is the second in command of, of the Linux kernel. And, the, you know, the press loves this, right? Because Alan Cox, you know, looks like a hacker, right? He's like, he's like the Alan Moore of, 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 of technicality, right? You know, they look exactly the same. They have strange ethnic accents. They have the same beard and the same Christian name. Yes. So, they, actually, they're probably the same person thinking about it. But, um, um, so, uh, um, uh, and writing this report and getting that kind of coverage and introducing um, uh, the media to people that they can, like, put into their pocket as, ah, here's the Welsh Bill Gates, um, enables them to make a story, and that enacts policy change, and it also changes the presentation of people... Um, who are usually stereotyped in a very bad way in the media that has an incredible knock-on effect into um, getting people into the corridors of power. If you think the presentation of, of hackers in the media is bad, uh, you know, the idea of actually being able to walk into Congress without the sergeant of arms holding you down or without you having to do, you know, the standard presentation of... of I, you know, I am the Paul Revere of of of, um, of hacking, and um, and uh, but I'm 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 not like that anymore. And this is what you should do. But actually, have um, behind the scenes consultation where people come to you and say, "Listen, we're thinking about rolling out this form of technology. How will this affect your freedoms?" Which does genuinely happen now. Um, um, and um, and the Open Rights Group does does get that kind of potential to happen. And so does um, the EFF. Obviously, we get consulted about laws. Which which wouldn't normally have happened before. And in places like um, an Eastern European country that temporarily slips my mind, but actually managed to get a pretty much um, a liberal copyright provisions into the constitution of the country, right? Simply by being around at the right time and having that kind of expertise. So um, let me kind of, this is interesting, because this is, this is the point where the, um, the PowerPoint crashed. So um, I will have to sort of liberally invent this kind of thing now. Oh, okay. So um, doo -doo 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 -doo. so this is the sort of end result of what you get here. This is, can you see that? You can't really see this. This is the, this is the um, parliamentary record for the United Kingdom. And this is actually a mention of the Open Rights Group in a parliamentary question, which if you've ever been stuck with CPAN, you'll realize is, you know, basically... I don't know, like being stars in your eyes or, or American Idol for ugly politicians. And, um, and this, was the, this was the mention of the Open Rights Group, and the Open Rights Group is now invited to Parliament, and it's still, you know, one person sitting there. It's still the people that she's consulting with, the people like um, Ben Laurie, who is on our board, and um, uh, Alan Cox, as I say, uh, Richard Clayton, um, security professionals, um, um, well-known people within the British um, sort of security um, uh, uh, industry, and academic community who are now actually invited to, to discuss these matters um, with policymakers. Although uh, I have to say, Richard Clayton was always doing was doing a good job doing that before. So um, let's um, let's just run through. Um, um, sort of basically my, my tips if you want to do this in your own country, right? Okay, first of all, 
it's very important, I hope, uh, um, I don't know who this is more insulting to for the Open Rights Group, the advisory board or the real board. Okay, so for the advisory board, what you want is incredibly outspoken people who feel that they've got some commitment and involvement in what you're doing, and you can go there and they'll, they'll go on TV and they'll speak to people and they'll, they'll, they'll make controversial statements, but they can back it up with technical expertise. Um, you want really boring people to be the people that you go and talk to on a daily basis and say, I don't think we can afford um, the blow anymore. Um, so um, um, maybe, maybe the blow is for the advisory. Anyway, okay, so, um, so that's the first one. Okay. Secondly, it's very tempting to make this your, um, your first project, right? And, and don't. You know, I, I think the sort of hacker sort of larval cycle is that, you know, when... when um, when you're, you're, you, you really just begin to feel your oats, as it were, and so you're 17 going on to 24, um, you really want to get involved in this kind of pro project and you're terribly committed to it. This is not a good first project because if you make a mistake, it's very public, and you really also, because of the money thing, people are very cautious about dealing with, with people who don't have a track record, and it's really good to sort of build up your name in the community. A lot of the people that originally came to the Open Rights Group um, were already fairly substantial people within communities running conferences um, in the UK and um, and this seems to be generally true you know the EFF emerged from the well um, you have groups like the Hacker Foundation emerging from DEFCON it's really good to have a pre-existing community that you can draw those those initial donators to and who will appreciate someone sitting there beside them doing this kind of legwork um, yeah, so, so the, the point that I think is really good for this is when you suddenly wake up and you're 29 and you realize you've wasted your entire life doing, like, exploits. Or, or, or in my case, writing like, angry letters to The Guardian. So um, at that point, you sort of sit there going, well, what am I going to do? And um, um, you can go and become a security professional and make lots of money, or you can go around asking for $5 bills from 1,000 people. But, you know, you'll go to heaven because of that. Um, uh, yeah, work with the Creative Commons people. One of the biggest groups that has been really successfully internationally is Creative Commons. And as I say, it, it's, it's not always obvious where um, in the sort of connection between the politics of hacking and um, the kind of um, uh, minutiae of the copy fight battle. Um, um, uh, why that connection should be so strong. But in fact, it turns out to be really useful for two reasons. One, the Creative Commons people tend to be the right kind of people tend to be the kind of people that have a commitment and an understanding of um, of the wider issues. And uh, if they don't at the beginning, they very soon do because all of the sort of threats to um, the free distribution of information online are all the, pretty much the same threats that, that occur to hackers. You know, there's no, there's no coincidence that the DMCA, a copyright legislation, actually proved to be one of the greatest offensive tools against um, the free exchange of information in the security community. It's because copyright is the, is the excuse, is the, is the root password for, for locking down the internet. Now. And the Creative Commons people know this kind of thing, um, but they're also, um, and the iCommons, which is the international part of Creative Commons, also has a kind of credo of not getting involved in politics. So uh, that enables them to establish themselves in almost any country and, um, and, and not get the kind of like askance looks. That, that, that might otherwise happen. Um, so working with them may, means that you, you, you gain a little bit of credibility, you make yourself appear um, safer than you, you, you are in the global hacker conspiracy, but also you have um, a, 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 good, a good contact in almost every country. Um, You'll make mistakes. One of the, I, I mean, I can be honest about this. When we were setting up the Open Rights Group, um, one of the things that we missed, uh, um, or almost missed, was an attempt to do a reform of, um, of the uh, sort of anti-hacking laws in the UK that would have banned hacking tools, which is a frequent um, political issue, right? Uh, uh, attempts to um, ban tools that um, have dual uses, both as hacking tools and as a security audit and analysis, sort of, um, um, uh, you know, crack, whatever. So, um, uh, so uh, this, was, this was actually proposed and went up right to um, the highest level, and it was only caught at the very last minute. And what did we learn from that? Well, we learned that we had to anticipate these things before they happened. So we made sure that the contacts uh, um, uh, org were, were better um, going through into the future. 
don't agonize over the name, right? So, so about the first two panel of meetings of the board, we're going, well, should we be digital rights network? But people will think it's like a pro DRM group, or should we be, you know, hackers against the world? No, 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 too offensive. How about the the give me a fiver group? No, 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 too obvious. And and, um, and this went on endlessly. And you know, we chose, or th they chose. I mean, I'm kind of playing this dual role here because, you know, I, I, I was at a certain distance and watching all of this. EFF wasn't directly connected to, to how this stuff was going through, but I got the, got the opportunity to see it fairly close hand when it did. Um, and uh, Open Rights Group was like a total committee decision. And as soon as we started publishing things, you know, the register was very kind of like, what's an open right anyway? Does that mean the right to open doors? What are you talking about? And of course, you know, it means nothing, but within six months, it becomes everything, right? Um, and you know, um, at the EFF, we have the same problem in that you know, we do something absolutely brilliant. Someone says, "Thanks to the, electron the Electric Freedom Foundation or the you know the, the the Easy Fighting Fund," and they have no idea what the acronym means. So, so you know, it's a problem that everyone has, but you live with it. What's the reward? The reward is that you suddenly find yourself being the Uber expert, right? You suddenly become. Um, not only the person who gradually picks up knowledge about very abstruse areas, and you know, um, I, I, part of I think why the reason why all of us are here at the moment is because of that 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 almost sort of visceral requirement to learn more. And if you find yourself being the bridge between real, genuine experts and people who there is a real need for them to understand this, pretty soon it's the, it's the perfect exercise for learning very broadly and very widely about a lot of object of things, right? Um, and in the end, you kind of become too much of an Uber expert and you suddenly realize that you're gonna be stuck with this for the rest of your life. I, I once did, I, 90 something, I, um, I, I did one interview about Kevin Mitnick in the UK and suddenly I was like the Kevin Mitnick expert and like, they'd phone me up going, we hear he's had some coffee. Um, do you have anything to say? And you know, I don't know. I mean, I just read what everybody else does. You know, I, I, I just have the banner ad at the top of my thing. It's like, you know, that's all I know. He's, he should be freed. And, um, and you know, I, and I'd have to say that to like Newsnight or like, you know, 24 hours or whatever every day. So that's the reward. You get to meet people and people are incredibly grateful, right? It's unlike any other situation where you find yourself com um, 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 competing with your friends, right? That's one of the biggest problems about working in environments where everybody's committed to what they're doing. Sometimes you find that you're competing. And in this kind of situation, you find that you're actually helping everybody around, right? You have money so you can help people organize things and plot things. When people call, you can put them in contact with the people that they should know. And that doesn't necessarily just mean that um, um, you're putting them in contact um, with, with, with foolish media folk. Eventually people will call saying, listen, I have this cool project and I really need to find somebody else that would know this, um, how to do this. Do you know anybody like this? And um, it's surprising how many really interesting and strange left field projects um, um, get backing and get pick up and get, and get taken away and, and get far wider publicity as a result of that. Now I'm sure that for instance Tor and GNU Radio would be, would be you know, household names in this house, right? Um, um, had the FF not been involved in some way um, with representing them. But it really helps if like a, a journalist calls and they say we'd like to know more about anonymity for us to point to a really useful, really powerful project that, 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 that um, presents a positive light on anonymity. And I think that helps those projects and it helps the image of all of us. And talking of help, um, um, how, how, how can we help? If there's anybody here who's interested in doing this, this is basically my job now, is that I go out and try and like plan these seeds, thanks. Um, and, um, and there are ways we can help. We can't help you with money, um, but we can certainly help you because effectively, we end up doing this function for the whole of the world, right? So earlier today, I, I had an email from someone in Malaysia, someone reasonably knowledgeable about, um, about the anti-censorship mechanisms, or the censorship me mechanisms going on in Malaysia, um, but they needed to know other people, so they came to us. And if there is a small group starting in Malaysia, in any of these countries, um, we can put those people in touch with who they are. And again, you know, we get press um, when Brazil bans YouTube, um, 
Brazilian newspapers call us. And um, it's really lucky that Seth Show and one of my colleagues speaks Portuguese, right? Because otherwise we'd be going, um, just pretend the phone didn't ring. Um, so so, so we, can, we, can, we can act as a, as a larger conduit. So if you are interested in doing this, um, definitely come to talk to us. Um, and in return, all we ask is that if you have that other five pound that you didn't donate to your fledgling country, um, of course, donate it to us. Um, and I told you that we, we managed to, to put in a donation plea every couple of minutes. Um, so that, that's pretty much it. Um, and uh, if, if you are interested, um, if there's anybody here from Britain, I have, I have three overrides cards which you can share amongst yourselves. Um, and um, I have plenty of information. I probably won't be around that much in the Q&A section. Um, because um, uh, because the way that the international world works, I have to do a, a conference call on a really strange time zone. Um, but I'll definitely be around after the EFF panel, and if you have any questions, um, I'll be glad to answer them there. So thank you very much.